just one titty bit of toast. We've got to put them straight. We're going to be the mix. Yeah! We don't like breakfast for the sparrows. Nothing to them, mate. We're going to be the mix. Hi. This week we're going to do something a bit different, a bit fun, I hope. Normally I give you a writing mission, but I was thinking, if you want to be a good footballer, you have to watch a lot of football. If you're going to be a great musician, you should listen to a lot of great music. If you're going to be a good cook, you probably should eat a lot of good food. That's partly why we're in this kitchen. But if you want to be a really good writer, you should probably read a lot of great writing. So I thought I would read you a bit of great writing. I'm going to read you one of my favourite ever short stories. It's quite old now. It's by Joan Aiken, who wrote all these books and lots more. One of a great writer. And it's called The Cereal Garden, as in breakfast cereal. That's what the Weetabix is doing here. And I would like you just to enjoy the story. And then for your writing mission, just write me something that comes into your head after you've read this story. So it could be about beautiful gardens, because this is a story with a beautiful garden. It could be about breakfast cereal. Let's move it. Uh, it could be about love, because this is a great love story. I'm not going to say any more than that. It could be about soda bread. This is my soda bread, which I'm waiting to cool. The, so this is The Cereal Garden by Joan Aiken. And at the beginning of the story, our hero Mark is going to the shops to buy some breakfast cereal. And he's got to do this because his father has foolishly locked himself and all the food into the larder in a vain attempt to hunt down a mouse. Mark ran across the fields to Miss Pride's shop at Sticks Corner and asked if she had any cornflakes. I don't think I've got any left, dear, said Miss Pry. I'll have a look. I think I sold the last packet a week ago Tuesday. What about the one in the window, said Mark. That's a dummy, dear. Miss Pry's shop window was full of nasty, dingy old cardboard boxes with nothing inside them and several empty display stands which had fallen down and never been propped up again. There were a few small, tired-looking jars and tins which had worn and scratched as if mice had tried to get into them and then given up. Miss Pride herself was small and yellowish. She rooted rather hopelessly in a pile of empty boxes. Mark's mother never bought groceries here, if she could help it, since the day when she had found a label inside the foil wrapping of a cream cheese that said, this cheese best before May the 11th, 1899. No cornflakes, dear. Any wheat crispies, puff corn, rice nuts? Nothing left, only breakfast bricks. I've never heard of them, said Mark. Or of a jar of ovo, you spread it on bread. It's nice for breakfast, said Miss Pride, with a sudden burst of salesmanship. Mark thought the ovo looked beastly, like yellow paint. So he took the packet of breakfast bricks. It wasn't very big. And on the front of the box was a picture of a fat, repulsive boy, rather like the chubby Augustus, banging on the plate with a spoon. They look like tiny doormats, said Mrs Armitage. They taste like them too, said Mark. I must hurry or I'll be late for school. There's a nice cut out garden on the back of the box though. Don't throw that away when it's empty, Mum. Goodbye. Bye, Dad, he shouted through the larder door. Hope Mr Ellis comes soon to let you out. And he dashed off to the school bus. So what you've got to know is that in the back in the day, on the back of your cereal box, there was sometimes like a model in cardboard and you cut it out and you glued it together. It could be a model of a footballer or a house or a rocket and it was, you just folded it over. And that's what's on the back of the box. At breakfast next morning, Mark had a huge helping of breakfast bricks and persuaded his father to try them too. They taste like esparto grass, said Mr Armitage. I know, but do eat some more. I want to cut out the model of a garden on the back. It's very lovely. Yes, it is rather pleasant, said Dad. It looks like an 18th century German engraving. It certainly was a stroke of genius putting it on the packet. No one would ever buy these things to eat for pleasure. Pass me the sugar. Mm. And the cream. And the strawberries. It was the half-term holiday. So after breakfast, Mark was able to take the empty packet away to the playroom and get on with the job of cutting out the stone walls the row of little trees, the fountain, the yew arch, the two green grass lawns and the tiny clumps of brilliant flowers. He knew better than to stick the tabs in the slots and secure with glue, as it said on the packets. 
He'd had models from these packets before and they always fell to pieces unless you firmly bound them with sellotape. It was a long, fiddly, pleasurable job. Nobody interrupted him. Miss Armitage only cleaned the play Mrs. Armitage only cleaned the playroom once every six months when she made a ferocious descent and tidied up the tape recorders and roller skates and meteorological sets and dismantled railway engines and threw countless magazines and stringless tennis rackets into the bin. There were always bitter complaints from Mark and Harriet. Then they forgot and things piled up again till next time. As Mark worked, his eye was caught by a verse on the outside of the packet. Breakfast bricks to start the day, make you fit in every way. Children bang their plates with glee at breakfast bricks for lunch and tea. Breakfast bricks for supper too, give peaceful sleep the whole night through. Blimey, thought Mark sticking a cedar tree into the middle of the lawn and then bending a stone wall round the dotted lines. I wouldn't want anything for breakfast, lunch, tea and supper, not even Christmas pudding and certainly not breakfast bricks. He propped a clump of gaudy scarlet flowers against the wall and stuck them in place. The words of the rhyme kept coming back into his head as he worked and presently he found that they were rather fitted rather well to a tune that was ringing through his mind and he began to hum and then to sing. Breakfast brings to start the day and make you fit in every way. Blow, where did I put that little bit of sticky tape? Oh, here it is. Children bang their plates with glee. A breakfast bricks for lunch and tea. Slit the gate with a razor blade, but it'll have to be a pen knife. Breakfast bricks for summer too, supper too. Give peaceful sleep the whole night through. That's funny, said Mark. And it was funny. The open work, iron gate, he had just stuck in position. Now suddenly... On either side to right and left ran a high stone wall stretching away into the foggy distance and over the top of the wall he could see tall trees, yews and cypresses and others that he didn't know. Well that's the neatest trick I ever saw, said Mark. I wonder if the gate will open. He chuckled, thinking of the larder door and the gate did open and he went through into the garden. One of the things that had already struck him as he cut them out was that the flowers were not at all in the right proportion. But they were all the nicer for that. There were huge velvety violets and pansies the size of saucers and hollyhocks as big as dinner plates and the turf was sprinkled with enormous daisies. The roses though were tiny, no bigger than cufflinks. And there were real fish in the fountain, bright pink. I made all this, thought Mark, strolling along the mossy path. Won't Harriet be surprised when she sees it? I wish you could see it now. I wonder what made it come to life like this. And he passed through the yew arch as he said this and discovered that on the other side there was nothing but a foggy grey blankness. And that, of course, was where the cardboard garden had ended. He turned back through the archway and gazed with pride at a border of huge scarlet tropical flowers that were perhaps supposed to be geraniums but certainly hadn't turned out that way. No, of course, it was the rhyme from the back of the packet. He recited it, nothing happened. Perhaps I have to sing it, he thought. And feeling a little foolish, he sang it again to the tune that fitted so well. At once, faster than blowing out a match, the garden drew itself together and shrank back to its cardboard again, leaving Mark outside. What a brilliant hiding place that's going to make. When I don't want people bothering me, he thought. He sang the spell again just to make sure that it worked and there was the high mossy wall, the stately iron gate and the treetops. He stepped in, looked back, no playroom to be seen, only grey blankness. At that moment he was startled by a tremendous clang, the sort of sound the trump of doom would make if it was a dinner bell. Oh, blow, he thought. That must be lunch. He sang the spell for the fourth time and immediately he was in the playroom and the garden was on the floor beside him and Agnes was still ringing a dinner bell outside the door. All right, I heard, he said. And he glanced hurriedly round the remains of the packet to see if it bore any mention of the fact that it was magic. It didn't. He did, however, learn that this bit that he had made was section three of the Beautiful Breakfast Brick Garden series and that sections one, two, three, four, five and six would be found on other packets. In case of difficulty in obtaining supplies, please write to Frühstück Geschirrtelwell Industry in Shepherd's Bush. 11 pence a packet, Mark murmured to himself. That's 
that's not too bad. So we're going to stop there and we'll have part two.